Welcome to another episode of Alma's Summer Interview Series. Uh, we've got Sarah Wardle Jones with us. Hi. Erica Sipes. Hello. And I am Michelle Smith Johnson. We're the co-founders of the Alma Ensemble, a chamber music collective based in Roanoke, Virginia. We are beyond excited. I can't even believe it to have the incredible, spirited, mountain-moving New York Philharmonic violist Rebecca Young with us today. Becky, how are you? I'm okay. A little bit warm. <laughs> Getting warm up here, but but uh, happy to be with you. We are so excited to have you, um, and it's good to see you again. So just want to say thank you for being on our web show. Um, we wanted to start the interview by just talking about your career as a violist. I think in past interviews, you've said you, you kind of always knew you wanted to be a musician. Um, and you were accepted into Juilliard Prep, you attended Juilliard School, and you were the youngest person to successfully audition for the New York Philharmonic. Um, and we just wanted to know what that was like, what that experience was like for you, and um, yeah. How much time you got? <laughs> <laughs> Started, I guess, um, my parents, my mother was a stay-at-home mom, but she was a singer and she had wished her whole life she wanted to be a performer of some sort. Um, yeah. She used to take us to the, the young people's concerts in um, at the Philharmonic when Leonard Bernstein was conducting. And I was like two, I think, and, and she said she would bring candy or whatever that was okay back then. Nobody gives two-year-olds candy. Well, maybe some people do. But she said that afterwards, she'd have to pick up all the wrappers off the floor. You know? um, but I remember, uh, maybe not quite from the time I was two, but shortly thereafter, I remember him and his voice and his passion for music. And I, um, she said, I used to roll up the programs. Just like take one and put it here and take another one and go like this and pretend to play violin. When I was about four or five, um, I asked her, she, she thought I would play piano at least, like a lot of kids start on piano. And I said, no, I want to do this. And so she found the violin, she found a teacher, and um, I was off and running. When I was eight, I auditioned for the pre college at Juilliard and didn't get in, but they said, oh, there's talent there, let's give you to this teacher. She taught me every bit of um, uh, technique that I know. I knew. And then I, when I was 13, I re-auditioned for Juilliard and pre-college and got in. And then at 16, uh, I switched to viola. I was ready to quit. I wasn't inspired anymore by the, whatever was going on. And um, somebody said, try viola. And I said, okay. And, uh, and that was that. I switched and I got nine months later, I was at Juilliard. And at the beginning of my senior, I think it was my senior year, at the beginning of my, I graduated high school early, um, but, um, but at the beginning of my senior year, which I was not in my senior year, I auditioned for the Philharmonic. And I didn't think I was going to get in. I just thought, all right, whatever. My teacher was bugging me to take an audition. So I took that audition. And also I had a boyfriend at the time. And I thought, all right, well, he's in New York. And if I get in the New York Philharmonic, then maybe I'd have a chance with him. And we were, married, we were married for over 30 years. I have three kids. And I've, I've been there a long time at the orchestra. So you and I met recently when you were in town doing a series of concerts with the Roanoke Symphony. Um, and we were lucky enough to have you come and do um, a clinic and some master classes with my middle school students. And, and, and not to sound trite, honestly, but that will that visit will resonate with me for a really really long time um, because you are so kind to them and so um, willing to give of yourself and your wisdom um, and your love for students was immediately evident um, and they responded to you in a way that they hadn't responded to a lot of visitors that came in they trusted you really, really quickly. And for my students, that's tricky, you know. Um, I have they to say, are, uh, again, not to, sound, now, not to sound trite, but to say the visit stuck with me too. How the, the respect and the, the discipline, it, and there were some, you know, there's some kids who are testing you to the limit, <laughs> but they obviously have a tremendous amount of respect. There's a great group to work with. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, so you have worked 
for a, 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 a long time in your career, fostering music education and developing the very young people's concerts. So if you would talk to us a little bit about the role of music education and the, or the role that music education has played in your career um, and some of your favorite moments from those educational outreach projects. A, a while back, somebody, uh, they, they started with they have the young people's concerts from Leonard Bernstein era. And that's basically geared for like six to 12 year olds and um, a little grassroots movement sprung up um, and I think about five people, five musicians, and then some management as the education committee, education department got together and they decided they were going to do something for much younger kids for three to six year olds. And they had a host who was a percussionist. Uh, so he left and there was an opening for somebody to do it. And they, the, I'm kind of, I mean, I'm, I look like I'm sort of normal now, but I'm kind of the, the, the cut up of the orchestra, like the clown. So they came to me, these people, and they said, please do this. And I said, I've got three kids and a commute and a husband and dogs and chamber music and some teaching and, you know, and a full-time job. And I just, I cannot say yes to anything else. They said, look, it's a half hour. You're the only one we can think of that would do this. And it, it's really, it's a lot of fun. It's really not a big deal, not a big time commitment. And they sold me on it. So I said, all right, I'll try it. So, but I really had a lot of fun and I became sort of invested in it. I, I watched, the stories were great that, that were happening on the second half, but I noticed that we were sort of losing the energy of the audience as soon as the frenetic, you know, like I'm running around the stage or whatever's going on and, and having holding their attention. As soon as you sit back and start being a little passive and reading them a story and having lots of music, uh, j just music and no words, we kind of lost them. And I, I, you know, all those years I kept saying, well, can we just sort of take it off of the screen and bring it down onto the stage and have, uh, you know, anyway, the, I was home and I don't really play piano, but there was a uh, modern major general. One of my kids must have had it up on the on the piano, and I'm starting dun 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 dun. I am the very model of a modern major general, a bishop, blah, blah, blah. and I thought, oh, that'd be great for an allegro demonstration. I wonder if they'll let me do it. And I asked them. They said, yeah, go ahead, try it. And I did it, and they loved it. And to counter that, for adagio, and you know, to, well, oh, everybody, and and it, it um, in a tree by a river, a little tom tits, right? So I went. There's a word that in music we want you to know. Adagio, adagio, adagio. It was so much fun to do that, and the response that that you know they were like, "Got to do more of this." So there was always this what we called at the time the shtick piece. Um, that was in the middle of all of this, and, and there were stories, but then little by little it became sort of one whole half hour organic show as opposed to the first half and the second half. And and um, I want to do this full time. Anybody out there know how I can, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Working on it. And since COVID and we've been home, uh, the education department, the, the um, I, I don't know what her title is, but I guess the assistant to the to the head of education and I have been we partnered and have come up with these um, sort of an online version, not sort of very much an online version of these very young people's concerts called the New York Philharmonic's Very Young People's Concerts at Home. And we've been featuring a uh, one instrument at a time. And it's it's each one gets a little bit better because we don't know what we know we're starting out from scratch and and as you probably know, when you zoom and play with somebody, it might sound like you're together like this, but once you put it together, it's really off. So I'm, um, we come up with the idea for the show, and then I write the script up, send it to whomever our guest instrumentalist is going to be, and then I record my parts, and they record their parts, and it looks like we're having a conversation, and, and it's uh, super fun and getting better and better. We have two more to go um, for the season, what we're calling the season. Um, that is so dear. And that gives um, parents resources, that gives teachers resources to, you know, to you continue yet? to educate. I'm going to send it to you. Have you seen it yet? I've, I no. saw the one with Cynthia. Oh, that's the first one. So yeah, I like it. They've been it getting was better. Really good. It was cute, but we're, we're, they're getting better. And, and the, um, the, the, after Cindy, we did, oh, the harp. She took us on a little tour of her instrument and then the flute 
uh, with our principal flute player. And they're interactive. They're part that there's like a, a supply list what, um, at the beginning or, or what you need to have ready to go. Like you need a scarf for one thing because we're talking about legato and staccato or the, the flute. And um, uh, or crayons for the second segment we call picture the music and you're drawing while you're listening to something or, or whatever it is. And it's very cute. But the, the one that's coming out this Saturday is uh, trumpet. He's unbelievable. So we tell a little story and he's playing his excerpts. So uh, he'll play something. And then I, I think, I can't remember which order it's in, but anyway, you hear the story and then you hear the music that he's doing to go along with the, with the story and um, a lot of fun. After these very young people's concerts, we have what one, two, three, four, we're on the fifth one. So the fourth one's coming out Saturday. And the next one will be five and six is the last one that we've planned so far. And I just spoke to the people at the education department and said, uh, I'm not getting paid for any of these either. So it's like, I just want to do it. And I have to tell you, um, you know, during this crisis, sometimes you can sit there and just stare at the walls and, and you know, life goes, gets a little heavy and you get really scared and entertainment, we're going to be the last ones to come back to work. Um, so this making these videos for kids, it's, it feels like there are a lot of people who need the resource, need the help, need the, you know, to read. And so the next episode will be something about, um, we're all different. We're all the same inclusion and, uh, for kids who are in hospital settings, you know, right now, kids who are, um, maybe go undergoing cancer treatment or whatever else, they can't have, people can't come in from the outside to entertain them, to keep them, their minds off of what's going on. And so I, I want to be able to bring something like that to them that works for them and, and other, other things that are, uh, relevant to this, uh, Black Lives Matter. There's, there's so many places where I think we can bring the joy of what we do. And I have one, I mean, that clown element that I mentioned before that I'm just like, uh, music doesn't, classical music doesn't have to be boring. Frankly, sometimes it can be boring to me. You know, I, I, I mean, not, it's not that it's boring. It's that it depends who you're playing it for and, and how, how you're trying to present it. And I, uh, if you're trying to, you know, sometimes, yeah, it's great to have a, a, a steak for a meal, but it's also nice to have dessert. And sometimes you got to just give the kids dessert. Like let them have their sweets first, you know, and then let them right. lead them to the help. Later they'll like their vegetables, but right now they just want the dessert, the, the sweet stuff. And uh, I think that what we do is kind of the sweet stuff. And then you get to Absolutely. Little, like sneaking in the kale to something really great and chocolatey, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> but to do that effectively takes so much planning and so, it is so intentional the things yeah. that have to go into place to make sure that kids stay engaged. It's not, um, it's not like, Oh, we can do this and we can do this. Everything has to be planned to the T in order for it to work. So that's exactly. Okay. It doesn't pass yeah. the what test. Like if you're telling them something or doing something, a lot of times I'm saying, wait, why, why are we doing that? They're like, well, cause it's funny. I'm like, no, funny by itself is not good enough. I sometimes, but usually it's, you know, I think it has to be, uh, this has to have something to do with that. And music is the same thing. You're playing a Bach when you're playing some kind of phrase. You don't just play this note and then this note and then this note. You're playing, this note came from there and it's going to that one and it's going to there. And you're telling a story and it's, it's, po it's a poet. You're telling poetry. You're trying to paint a picture, even if it's not, even if it's just colors. It's not necessarily uh, an animal and the, the sun and, you know, it's, it's so it's the same thing when you're putting these things together. It's got to be like, all right, we're doing this. Why? Well, because we did this. And then that's going to this. And, you know, anyway. Yeah. yeah. But I, I didn't study this. I just, it's, I'm doing what I like, what I think somebody else might like. And I guess that's, that's what I tell my kid. My, my eldest is a teacher. He's a music teacher. Teaches uh, middle school orchestra and band. And they love him. And I, yeah, yeah. And I knew that's not an easy, right? That's a hard place to be, but he loves it and they love him. And it's just because he loves what he's doing. He loves what he, right. he's like a kid. He's a big kid. They know he loves Star Wars and he's, 
he's silly, but he doesn't take any prisoners. He's like, he's like you, you know, he's, <laughs> he loves the fun, but they respect him because they know they have to respect him. Yeah, exactly. Right. And there's a love there too. You know, I'm sure your son loves his students as much as we do, you know, um, and in order to love someone, you can't let them do what they want all the time. No, I know. I learned that late. I'm teaching my kids now. <laughs> well, I'm going to stray from my question I was supposed to ask. I do this to the girls all the time. <laughs> Sorry, it's the way it is. Um, but I just, because you're a mom of three and you were married, um, I just kind of wanted to ask you about the whole balance thing and how you've dealt with all the roles that are involved with being a woman in you know, a professional role that takes so much of your time and your heart and your energy. So, and I know you've, your kids are now grown up, it sounds like. Um, but can you talk a little bit about that? Because I know as an, I'm a mom myself and a wife, it, it's been a constant juggling act with trying to figure out family life and professional life. How do you do it? You know, they, you have a kid, you're going to figure out a way, right? Because you just make it, you make it work. It's not easy. I've, if people talk about balance, I've never found balance. I've always found like I live on a freaking pendulum, right? I'm holding on to the thing. And sometimes I'm involved with my family and sometimes I'm bogged down at work. And, and uh, if I'm over here, I'm feeling guilty about that. And if I'm over here, I'm feeling guilty about that. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I don't think that if somebody had the answer, they'd be very, very wealthy by now. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I don't meditate or anything like that, but I think it's really important to take time for yourself and, and to, um, it, it's very hard to turn off. I don't do social media, really. I'm not on Facebook. I'm not on Instagram. I'm not on that stuff. Although I think I should be, maybe if I want to do these very young people's concerts, like full time, I should be doing that kind of thing. But um, but even just watching the news these days, or saying it's it's a it's a lot, and it, to turn it off, and um, every once in a while reflect and say, wait a minute, all right, what's going on in my life, and reassess what's important. I'll tell you what, you don't want. I mean, I would r much rather not have this COVID thing. But the silver lining, if there is one, is that a lot of us have had time to reflect on what's important, and um, and and to spend time even virtually with people that we haven't before and have really meaningful conversations with um with friends and and just try and figure out what's important i I'm, i know people who ha were in sort of high powered jobs and who are um e either now that's the litter box that's okay um it, 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 even now they are um uh if they're not working, they they are reassessing how much. I mean, like the Philharmonic, we're not. Uh, we've been cut. Our, our salaries have been cut. Um, some of us more than others. Um, and, oh, there he goes. And um, and so you think, okay, oh my God, what am I going to do? Well, you live on less. Or a lot of people have left their homes and gone and moved elsewhere, and maybe decide they're going to just teach and not be in the farm anymore or whatever. You know, we don't know when it's going to come back. It's definitely, we're definitely not coming back before January. We, uh, it could be April or May and we don't know at what capacity. We don't know what's going to happen to our contracts. We you know we, nobody knows anything. So you, um, I guess you just hold uh, fast to the things that are important to you. And, and even when there's no COVID, <laughs> Um, it just teaches you, it has taught a lot of us to um, focus on what is important. We've talked about balance and we've talked about inspiration, but one of the things that I find, I don't know, maybe not unique to this profession, but um, there's an element of, of discipline, right? Like you, like you said, you have to practice, you have to just go in and do the work, but then you have to stay inspired too. And I think traversing those um, letting one inform the other and that kind of thing is always a dance and that people approach it differently. And so I think you've talked quite a bit about this, but I wanted to kind of ask directly if you've learned any 
techniques for that over the years or it's kind of ebbed and flowed for you? Or? I am most inspired when I'm uh, sharing what I'm doing and getting positive feedback. And, and then the other day I was, I was thinking, okay, I, I need something. My 23 year old wants to be an actor and he's kind of scared right now because everything is shut down. Everything is stopped. He also beatboxes and he sings and he's got a great speaking voice. I'm like, there's so many things you can do out there, Michael. And uh, so I said, all right, we're doing the percussion um, uh, episode now coming up. And I said, beatboxing is like, that's vocal percussion. Why can't I have you on this? Mm -hmm. So I, I wrote a song. I just, all of a sudden it came to me, um, beatboxing is fun because, wait, wait. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember how it goes. Beatboxing is fun because you do it with your mouth. Yeah, they do it in the north and they do it in the south. Do it in the east and they do it in the west. Yeah, beatboxing is fun because percussion is the best. Something, you know, <laughs> something, and something. I get something like it's so stupid, but it's so fun. And so he was here uh, and I said, oh, Michael, Michael, I came up with a song for the day. And uh, I said, ready? Um, you start. He said, what? I don't even know what you want me to do. I said, just give me an intro. So it goes, whatever he does. <laughs> and I ended up doing it. And he started laughing because he just thought it was silly, but really fun. And then we got beatboxing is fun. <laughs> beatboxing is fun. <laughs> <laughs> just we were laughing. And so if we're enjoying it, then other people enjoy it. And, I, you know, it sort of feeds itself. It's like sourdough starter, right? You just keep feeding it, and then you can just keep getting stuff out of it. How's the connection, that? yeah, it's so except, true. Except yeah. my birthday was a couple of weeks ago, and somebody gave me sour, sour sourdough starter, and yeah. I killed it. I don't think you can kill it, but I think I <laughs> I'm a good cook. I'm a good baker, but I killed my sourdough starter. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> but other than that, yeah, I like my analogy. Every advanced string player I talk to, I always ask them, about their instrument and how they acquired it. And I know that you play on a 17 and a half inch viola. You wanna see it? Um, I, uh, yeah. yeah, please. It stays here and it's in its crate. <laughs> it, it's, um, it's a Magini and it's, it was made in 1619. So it's now over 400 years old. Wow. It's got this incredible. It's got this beautiful perf double purfling here. And it was actually cut down. It was a bigger, it was played, we think. It was played as a viol, it was bigger. And uh, viola de gamba or whatever, but it has this, this double purfling around here. And here it was drawn on. You can, if you, it's hard to tell over this, but anyway. She's a beauty, but yeah, she's huge. I never re realized how big it is until I see um, a, a picture in the New York Times, like some kind of a review of the Philharmonic, and, it, and they somehow right. get me in and they're like, holy moly, <laughs> my small on that thing. Well, when you put the scroll up toward the camera, it looked like you just like went into another room. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> like you were transported to. Exactly. A different, complete space. A lot, of, a lot of, um, wait, let's see, this side maybe. A yeah, little, they call it worm damage. Oh, wow. In there. But it's all, everything has been repaired over the years. And of course, I, I should look so good at 400 years old. <laughs> <laughs> 400 years old. But, um, what happened was there was a, there was a, uh, a piece that was being commissioned for my stand partner, Cynthia Phelps, and me, a double viola concerto by Sophia Gubaidulina. People say Gubaidulina, but I met her, and it's Gubaidulina, Gubaidulina, just let you know. To know. Anyway, um, she wrote this piece for us, and the uh, funny story was when we were, we didn't know about it yet, but the personnel manager came out on the stage at a, a rehearsal and it was must have been at the end of the season and so Cindy and I were kind of okay I told you I'm, I'm kind of a clown and and we we have all this uh also we've been sitting together for a really long time so we have our our, our uh, folder where the music is and we have this kind of a system so if you point over here this corner it means gosh we haven't played together in a while now it means um 
God, I forget already. If you go like this, you take your bow and swipe it down this side, it means uh, thank you. And over here means sure enough. And up here, it means sorry. And down here, it means, uh, I don't know, uh, to the conductor, like, go away, you smell. Or so, you know, so we, have all these little, <laughs> we have all of these little, um, like, we could have a whole complete conversation. And there have been times where uh, I live to get her to lose it in the middle of a piece on stage, in the middle of a concert. So I'll do, I'll point to something or put like, you know, letter A and letter B. And so I'll point to different things on the music to spell something. And sometimes she's like, what? And then finally she gets it. And then tears start coming down. I mean, I love moments like that. Um, so we had been kind of cutting up a little bit like that during some particular rehearsal. And the personnel manager came out and uh, after at intermission and said, the conductor wants to see you. My, it was Maestro Mazur. Kurt Mazur wanted to see us in his room and both of us went, oh. Oh no. Oh. We're in trouble. And so we got called up and we're waiting in the hallway and they finally have us come in. And he's, he told us that he and his wife were commissioning a piece for the two of us. They know that we're good friends and they, they love both of us. And so they didn't want to just write a one concerto, they wanted a double concerto. And um, so for, we were like, we thought we were in trouble. It was, that was the first reaction. We went in the hallway and you know, you're talking about women and everything. We walked into the hallway and we went, what are we gonna wear? <laughs> Um, right. So, yeah. So the series where I'm going with this is that she had just acquired a million dollar uh, Gaspar de Salo instrument, and I was playing on a I don't know my my must have cost. I mean, compared to a, a another instrument, it's fifteen thousand dollars or twenty thousand. It was like nothing. Anyway, it's not. I think that's what I played when I was in Roanoke, actually, because I had just come off of an injury. I had or I had. Uh, mm -hmm a hole in my tendon in my right arm. And that's all fine. But when I was coming back, I was trying to get this back and I was like, oh my gosh, I gotta work really hard and then I strained this one and that still has some issues. But anyway, um that instrument it didn't come I mean to play that side by side with the Gaspar de Solo was not gonna cut it. So the management said, well we have an instrument fund and there's room in that budget for you to get an instrument. And I was I mean I, I honestly, I didn't know. I thought you change a string when it breaks. And I didn't find out that when your instrument is not sounding good, one of the things you do is change the strings or you get an adjustment. I didn't know. In years and years, I just didn't know because I never talked about it because I would go to work and play my job. But then, I don't know. I didn't, I was never a gear, like a gear head, as they say, for yeah. some, um, or a viola nerd. And, uh, but I learned mostly from Cindy. And uh, so, so I had some people putting out feelers and we found, we found a great Amati that I fell in love with. And then we actually had it, took it in to be looked at and appraised. And our former concertmaster came with me, Glenn Dictoro, and because he knew all about this kind of thing. And, and he said, we were in there and whatever was going on when we left, he said, can't get that instrument. I said, why? He said, because they're, I don't know what it is, but I smell a rat. I don't think that they're being honest about what's going on. It feels like, it just feels like there's some, there's a scam going on and, and it's, it's not le legit. It may not be what it says it is, or the price may be way high because they're, anyway, so that fell through. And then uh, somebody called me and said, I have this big instrument. It's really, really big, but you've got to just play it. And I said, I don't want such a big instrument. I so I'm playing 16 and a half. That's enough. And uh, he said, just play it. Just see what you think. So I went and I played it like, uh-oh. <laughs> you know, it's like, this going, is it. it's like going and seeing a puppy. Like, you don't go to see a puppy unless you're seriously considering taking the puppy home, mm -hmm. right? Right. <laughs> That's what happened. So and the, the, oh, I never really had back problems or arm problems because of the instrument. I, uh, on the way, when I got over this, the whole my the, the tear in my tendon, um, I came back on the smaller instrument and now I'm back to the bigger instrument. But the only, I did have jaw, I have a pretty bad TMJ and I think it's from the big instrument. Wow. Other than that, that's all right. The price we pay. You've been in the orchestra for a long time. I imagine that has brought you all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, is there any one specific concert or set of concerts that have really stuck with you and left an impression on you that you remember? 
There are lots of different concerts. On a, on a fluffy note, we were playing that Goodbye Dulina. Uh, it was called Two Pats. We were playing it all over the world. Literally, we played it in South America. We played it on the East Coast and West Coast in Carnegie Hall. And we played it in uh, Amsterdam in the Concertgebouw. And uh, if you've ever been there, it's you enter from the top. So the orchestra is on a kind of a high platform stage. The audience is down on one level and then they have you know, the balconies. But when you enter, there are doors up at the top and you walk down the steps, kind of steep steps through the orchestra to the front of the podium. And you know, I, rem I just remember as I'm going down, the brass players are going, uh, 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 don't trip, don't trip. And guess what? I tripped. I didn't no. like behind, but I was like, oh, almost fell. That, <gasps> that's like a stupid fluffy moment, but a serious moment. Um, the orchestra went to North Korea uh, in 2008, I want to say, and we were invited by their government and we said, oh, okay, great. Thank you very much. And then they ignored them and I was like, you know, let it go. And then when they asked again, apparently the orchestra the Philharmonic got serious and the State Department got serious. And we, at the end of a I think it was an Asian tour. Well, I mean, we were in Asia, but I think it was solely Asia. Um, we were in, could it have been Beijing? I think we, we were in Beijing just before North Korea. We had this big meeting about security and what to expect. And they're going to take your phones away. They're going to collect your cell phones. And people are going to just show up. All of a sudden, there'll be a Korean person sitting next to you and being just very friendly. And those are your minders. They're just going to, you're going to notice that they're just going to be around so that, you know, you don't get into trouble and, you know, they're not going to say, hi, I'm your minder. I'm, you're going to stick with me. They're just there. And sure enough, that happened. Super nice people, educated and uh, around the world. Like some of them were educated in America, I think, or, or England. And, and it was just kind of bizarre, but um, very, very nice people. And they, uh, got off the plane, took a big picture of the orchestra. Oh, we went in on one big jumbo jet with all the press, Christian Amanpour and people from ABC and NBC and every, you know everybody, and all our equipment and um, and then we were on our buses at the airport. Finally, get on the buses, and you're driving through the town, and the people were sort of lining the streets, not to welcome us, but just like kind of doing their thing, like they've been told to be there so that we see people doing their thing. And the lights are on in front of us, but the people in the back bus reported that as we passed, you'd look out the window and the electricity went off. Like it was put on to make a show for us. We were in uh, one hotel, all of us in one big tower, nobody else there. I had a two bedroom, two bathroom suite to myself. Um, all the meals were taken, you can't just go to the local diner in North Korea or the local, you know, 7-Eleven, like you can in Japan or Korea or any place else. Um, so all of our meals were taken in the ballroom and they had, uh, they apparently had asked, what do Americans eat? And they said, well, for breakfast or, you know, yogurt or pancakes or eggs or something like that. They had everything that was mentioned to them. So the, the banquet, the night we got there, I didn't get to the concert. I should get to the concert, but the, um, it was, they had mutton and uh, uh, course after course after course after course. And of course, we're all very well aware that there's a lot of hunger and starvation there. And, and you know, it was, it was just kind of odd, this display they were putting on for us. They took us after we got there. You weren't, you couldn't go home and take a nap and opt out. You had to get back on the bus and go where they were taking you, which was to a, an amazing concert. Have you ever heard of Shen Yun? You, you know, those things, they, they hand out flyers and they, these people, it's like, I don't know if it's um, a, a very synchronized and coordinated, beautiful costumes. And uh, it, it was amazing. It was really a, a great thing, this concert, to see. We were dying because we were so tired, but it was, it was cool. We went back, we had this huge feast and... Uh, and then the next day we had um, the concert. So we had a rehearsal at the hall and lots of rules. Don't go here. Don't go there. You have to have, this is your ID that you're going to be given. And, and, all. Um, and we got on the stage and I don't even remember what we were playing. Maybe Divorce Up New World. There's a video of the whole concert. Uh, but the audience was 
you know, usually you're sitting there and you see people talking to each other or, or, you know, somebody's rattling papers or whatever it is. And cell phone goes off. You know, everybody, the women were all in their traditional uh, Korean dress. The men were all very serious with the picture of the deer leader on their labels, on their, on their lapels, sorry. And we, we were watching this and it was just kind of, and they were very polite. Nobody whispering, nobody doing it. It was just all clap at the same time, all stop at the same time. It was kind of bizarre. The end, I don't, oh, the end we played Arirang, which is their um, uh, folk, a folk song. And we played a version of that. And all of a sudden there was, we were leaving the stage and um, I, 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 I mean, I started to wave. Other people started to wave and they started to wave back. And we were all just in tears. There was like a, a moment, a magical moment of connection where we broke through something, something that music and humanity can do, only can do. And it was, uh, that was something that none of us will forget. Um, that sort of intangible, why did that happen? It was the music and the, it was, it, it uh, connected, they connected, maybe not so much with the Dvorak, but their song that we were playing for them. It's like, um, it's why, it's like I said before with the vegetables and the, and the dessert, sometimes you gotta give them what they want. You know, and right. not, make them hear something that you think they might like, you know, and there's one demographic out there as a, uh, that I've always been intrigued by the fact that we can't reach them, which is teenagers. The little kids love what we do. And even if they, you know, they, they, they disappear for a while and they'll come back as grown ups because it's something that's familiar to them. And, you know, when I was a kid, I did this, let me go to the Philharmonic. Um, but there's this demographic, unless they're really involved in music, in their lives, if they're playing in high school or, or something like that, or if they're going to become a musician, I, I find it hard to reach them. And, and one of the ways you can do that is by playing something that speaks to them. Don't, don't um, make them listen to what you play and think they're going to like it. You've got to sort of say, hey, look, this person does it. Look at, isn't that cool? <laughs> you know? um, or, or play something that um, resonates with them. And then little by little, you know, I've always wanted to develop a show for teenager, you know, for that, that, that sort of hard to reach group. Because I think that they could be moved by it like anybody else. Teenagers are humans too. Less so, right. but they are. <laughs> <laughs> I still have one, so I'm entitled to say that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, that's good. Well, maybe, it's interesting because I have a teenage daughter and mm -hmm. she's, She's not a musician, but she's been, she's grown up around me, of course, but she's really into video games. And mm -hmm. so I know that the way I can get her upstairs in the morning is yeah. if I play video game music on the piano of the right. game she loves. Right. And the other day was her birthday and she was just kind of staying downstairs. And my husband was like, how do we get her up? I said, no problem. So I found a piece from Animal Crossing, you know, some little arrangement. And I started playing it and like within 30 seconds, she was up like sitting on the top stair, just yeah. like, and she had this big grin on her face. Yeah. Like, yeah, I think it's like, exactly. just find what they love, you know? Mm -hmm. That's right. And, and then, then you can work backwards from there, I think. Um, we did something recently, I think it was uh, Obama was involved. It was a YouTube graduation thing. And uh, somebody on our artistic committee, somebody had a connection or somebody was asked, I don't know how it worked, but I'll, all I know is what they said, if you want to be involved, here's the music, wear black, let, put the thing in your ear and listen to the click track and send it in by, you know, nine o'clock tonight, whatever it was. And so I got on my phone, people were say, sending me a screenshot of Lizzo. I don't know who Lizzo is. I didn't, I had, a, I had to uh, look it up. And then it was, I do my hair talk to you. You know, baby, how you doing? I, I, now I was like, oh yeah, I know who she is. I just didn't know her name. Yeah. And uh, my kids, my, well, they're kind of involved in music. My son plays, I told you, he teaches music and stuff like that. But they just thought it was the coolest, even my daughter who will not, I mean, if we're playing Pixar movies or Harry Potter at the Philharmonic, I can't get her to come because they're classical, there's still classical music. We're still at the Philharmonic. I'm not going to go. It's because that's not cool. But Lizzo, you know, she, she wrote back, I sent it to her because everybody, I didn't even know, but uh, I said, look, and she went, what? You know, 
sent it to all of her friends. All of a sudden, mom's cool because she was playing with Lizzo. Did you know Lizzo played with Lizzo? Yeah. 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 Also in Pentatonix, that's another place that I I gotta put it on my list. I wanna write to that. I've written to them before and I have not had success in contacting them, but their beatboxer, Kevin, Mm -hmm. uh, he plays a cello. Yeah. Do something somehow, some kind of program. I, I guess I should make more of a proposal and send it, not say, hey, you play cello, want to play, and do something with us. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's really cool. I didn't know that he played cello. Oh, yeah. I think that's how the, the group found him online, if I'm, if I'm mm-hmm. not mistaken. Somebody saw him. I remember seeing that before they were a group because my son, Michael, the actor, he, he uh, lo- it was found the fe- pentatonics just before, like right when they were, or before they were on The Voice. Is that what it was? There was a competition that they won, Sing Off, uh, the Sing Off, something. And it's all acapella. And um, they, the, the group found him online playing his cello and beatboxing at the same time. Yeah, he played um, a piece called Julio mm-hmm. by Mark Summer from the Turtle Island String Quartet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's an amazing, it's great. Mm-hmm. Very, very talented guy. Very yeah. talented group. I love pentatonics. It's like my f- absolute favorite. Yeah. to listen to and I, I like to sing I'm not a singer but I like to harmonize and um, that's one of the reasons I was drawn to violas because I would get somebody to sing them I mean it's not one of the reasons why but it's one of the reasons why you I would not be you would not be surprised that I chose a lower voice because I would get somebody to sing the melody and I would sing the harmony and that's what the, the viola gets to do most of the time yeah you know once in a while we get the melody and uh, I could take it or leave it I like the harmony <laughs> yeah because you get to you get to experience those inner parts, yeah. And I think uh, I think that is sometimes more interesting. I love singing alto, and, yeah. You know, and the den community choirs and whatever. And I think it's a lot more fun. To, Me too. Yeah, I, I to experience those inner parts. Part. I actually end up singing the bass part, and my son, who is a bass baritone, he's got a really deep voice. He just cracks up because we'll be singing something on uh, some low note and. <laughs> He just looks at me like, how can you be lower than I am? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is a good time to move forward to this or that. So we're going to tell you or ask you two things and you pick your favorite. The first one is controversial, I'm sure. But Yankees or Mets? Mets. <laughs> well, that was quick. <laughs> yeah, not controversial at all. There's my answer. Uh-huh. When we we got married, uh, when I met my husband, well, he's my boyfriend, he lived in the shadow of Mets. Day. He lived in Queens. And so he was raised on the Mets. And I, we met in 80, uh, 85, 86. And the Mets were in the World Series in 86. So it was a great time to become a baseball fan. Until then, I could care less. But then, you know, so hard and fast. Yeah, very cool. Excellent. Okay, the next one is um, e-reader or a physical book? Physical book. I like e-readers because I don't like skipping over words that I don't know. So I love the fact that you can push the thing and find out what the actual, I mean, you obviously know in context what what's going on, but sometimes I want to know the actual definition of the But anyway, I like the book. Me too. Okay, now this is very serious. <laughs> okay. Crunchy or creamy peanut butter? Or almond butter? or whatever nut butter. I think all of the above. I uh, Technically, um, I, I would have to say creamy. My whole life, and I, lo- I eat almond butter way more than I eat peanut butter, but every time I put a knife in the jar to put it on a bone for my dog, first I put my finger in it. I will not put the knife from the bone back in the jar, just so you know, but I have to have a finger full of the peanut butter. And when I was a kid, I had peanut butter and jelly every single day and from kindergarten until I graduated after my junior year. My mother actually, well, except once in a while, she, anyway, but mostly peanut butter and jelly. And uh, the, the last day uh, that I was in school, she put a little note in there and she goes, last peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> Creamy. That's, That's awesome. sweet. Yeah. People are very serious about the, the bread, jelly, the type of jelly jam yeah the amount, and ratio the amount right the ratio exactly and what kind of bread and do you have crust or no crust and it depends on yes. the bread toasted yeah. or not toasted not for peanut butter and jelly yet. <laughs> what? It has to be toasted. yeah oh. no erica i am not here for that 
no, no. <laughs> no, and, and how like milk in my cereal, that's another thing. I never had milk in my cereal, so I just would eat it dry. What? When I was a Whoa. kid. Whoa. Yeah, Sarah's with me. See, thank yeah. you. Um, Black coffee uh, and dry cereal. Right. I've never tasted coffee in my life. <gasps> oh, I love wow. coffee ice cream, but it has to have fudge on it. Ice cream is a vehicle for fudge. That's what ice cream is for. <laughs> <laughs> Everything good. I mean, <laughs> Okay. No coffee. I think I would actually die. Yeah. No, yeah. Yeah. Well, let's not try. That. I don't know. No, yeah, no. I know. Yeah. By accident, I I once bought uh, decaffeinated coffee for my husband. I thought I was doing a nice thing. I saw a Starbucks coffee in Costco, and I brought him some. I never drink it. And he started getting these terrible headaches. We couldn't figure out why. And then all of a sudden, it dawned on him. He said, "Wait a minute. Did you buy?" Uh, decaf or caffeinated I said I don't know I think I bought decaf it's not what you drink he said no <laughs> <laughs> Oops. okay grab bag time yep all right so if you were stranded on a desert island but you could bring your phone with you to play one piece of music what would it be oh my gosh um I don't know. Could it be like a whole musical? Could it be like Hamilton sure. or Eat Candy? Yeah. Or <laughs> I love uh, Chichester Psalms by Bernstein. I love that whole thing. Uh, stuff from when I was a kid. You know, I think that's, I don't know. I love Broadway music. I love that stuff. Maybe a Pentatonix album. Maybe uh, Chicago. Oh, Chicago. <sighs> Sting. Can I bring them all? Can I just bring my whole <laughs> I don't know. We'll have to sit with the uh, if it were just one, um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I love a Wonderful Town. I love that soundtrack. I love um, uh, Damn Yankees. That's a great one. The, all that stuff. I don't know. I, I, something that, that lifts me up because I love sad music. I love a lot of these great sad stuff. What is it? The, the um, Taltz. Taltz is a, 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 a drug for um, psoriasis, I think, or something like that. And there's a commercial that has this beautiful song. And I looked it up, Taltz Commercial Music. And I, I could listen to that all day long. So don't ask me. Very eclectic. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just give you one of those iPad minis and you can. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll give you a little grace on that question. Yeah, I failed that question. I'm not going to an island. And, <laughs> and, you know. Okay. Then. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. But no, I'm done. Oh, okay. So the next question is, if you could magically acquire any skill overnight, what would it be? Um, uh, to play the guitar. Oh, okay. Just wake up and magically play the guitar. Yeah, I've, I've tried. I bought a guitar when I was in high school and I taught myself a couple of, like one half a song or something. And recently I took it out again because I'll send it to you. I, I made a, a song. Somebody asked me to do something for a board meeting, Philharmonic International Artistic Board or whatever, the advisory board. And they said, would you play something? And I said, yeah, sure. I didn't want to play Bach. What am I going to play? A solo viola thing. So I looked up um, and I'll give it to you. So, you know, I'll send it to you. And it was, I, I just looked up accompaniment to this particular song and there was somebody playing. I tried to reach him so that I could give him credit if I wanted to post. I don't, po I don't know how to post. I don't know how to do this stuff. So it didn't really matter. But um, I, I just, I wished I could play it. And I tried, I took out the guitar, I have it here. I haven't played it since high school. And it's hard, man. It's, everybody, everybody does it. So you'd think it's not that hard. But worst of all is the, I have steel strings. And I think I need to get nylon strings, which are easier on your fingers. Um, they hurt. But yeah, the steel does, especially if you have to shift or to thin. Anyway, I'd love to be able to do that. Maybe that's gone. Yeah. I think maybe I should, I'd, I'd like to be able to understand finances better. That, that would be useful. <laughs> or run a marathon, but I don't know, guitar comes to mind. Yeah. Um, do you ever find yourself recommending a book? Oh, repeatedly and if so what is that book um i love to read in this period you would think now i have time in fact when they closed the libraries i got in my car i was scared to death but i went to barnes and noble it was like the day before they closed down for good for till now and i bought a stack of books 
but um, the, the one that I wanted to get, and I have only gotten halfway through, but I really recommend it. A friend of mine was talking about it and she kept talking about it and talking about it. So I recommended it to another, to a group of my friends. They ripped through it. And because of these shows that I've been doing, uh, trying to get put together and practicing, and also just my head has been like, oh my God, what's going to happen with my life? And, you know, um, I haven't had the wherewithal to get through it. Maybe I'll start. You're inspiring me to get back to it. It's called, uh, Maybe You Should Talk to Someone. Yes. Uh, I've heard about this. Is it good? It's great. Did you read it, Michelle? Or you um, it? I, I'm an audiobook person. And yeah. so I felt disheveled lately. So I've been like jumping. So I've started it but I need to revisit it. It's on my, it's in my library. It's great. I uh, also, I didn't know I could ever be an audio person. Um, but I walk my dog all the time. So I listened to, um, God, now I'm not going to be remember what it is. It was, Oh, the, uh, crawdads where the crawdads sing. That was, Mm -hmm. I just finished that. It was a good book. Yeah. Good book. But this one is, um, it's very interesting. It's about a woman who is a psychologist and her treating, she's talking about her treating her patients while she's being treated for her emotions after a breakup with a boyfriend. And, and it's, it's um, I mean, it's a serious book. I don't think it's a novel. I think it's like a memoir, more of a, right? Isn't it more of a memoir? It's a real, real thing. Anyway, whatever it is, it's, it's very interesting. It really makes you think about it. Um, situations and life and and, and therapy and, and you know, things. That, I don't know. I, it's very thought provoking. It's a great book club book because it is a lot to dig, dig through. And right. I love the Nightingale. Nightingale. Is that what's called? I think it was Nightingale. It was okay. a, and the 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 one about um, all the light you cannot see. That's another really great book. This is a um, a girl, a blind girl, living with her father in uh, during in France, I think, during World War II, and the Nazis get to their shore, and and how she, oh, and her relationship with a Nazi soldier, how how they sort of connected, really beautiful, really beautiful. Oh wow! Wow! Yes. I'll have to write all these down. Really good. Uh, Becky, we're so thankful that you took the time to be with us today. You're inspiring, amazing, and we are just thrilled to have spent this time with you. We really appreciate it. Thanks for asking. I loved it. It feels more like therapy than like a like, like a talk show. It was really fun. It was really fun seeing you all again, and uh, and I think this is the most therapeutic thing anybody can do um, right now is to be able to share and, and to learn from others and. And I'm um, happy to be a part of it. Very good. We appreciate you so much and stay safe and be well. We'll talk soon. Okay. 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 I'm going to start that over. That didn't feel right. <laughs> Technology. Okay. Three, two, one. Uh-huh.